Today's guest is Palestinian-American Grammy Award-winning musical artist Farid Karam Nassad, also known as Frederick. Not only is Israel occupying Palestine, America is occupying it too. Snatch the backpack off. They start going through my bag and they're telling me to lay down on the ground. I'm like, what? I ain't laying down on the ground. And then all of a sudden, bam, he hits me with the back of his rifle from the back. One of the other soldiers knocks me down and he's back in my back pocket. I'm like showing him my passport. Man, he took that American passport. Do it on the ground. He didn't give a fuck about that. It's all engineered artificially to scare you, to make you not want to go back. Only one time I went, I was also subject to hours of interrogation and questioning. They asked me to draw a family tree of all of my extended family. They just drew him a big marijuana tree. <laughs> Cedo would come up to us and he kind of grabbed me by the ear. And, hey, listen, you don't speak English in my house. You only speak Arabic or I'm going to cut your hamam out. There's something similar in the Jewish community, but it's like, we'll do it again. Hello and welcome to episode 87 of the Palestine Pod, the weekly podcast where we break down the latest headlines dealing with Palestine from all over the world and bring you stories, commentary, and interviews with the aim of supporting the Palestinian struggle for decolonization, justice, and equal rights. I'm one of your hosts, Lara E. You might know me from Instagram as at Gaz and Girl, and I'm joined by my co-host, Mikey B. What's up, y'all? Mikey B on TikTok, Michael Scherzer on Instagram. And you can call me Mikey Intifada if you claim to be Jewish, but you just committed a pogrom in Hawara. Before we get into today's episode, please like, comment, and subscribe if you hang out with us on YouTube. If you're listening on a podcast app, subscribe and leave a review. As always, you can find our full episodes and sources on palestinepod.com. And if you want to get involved in the conversation, reach out to us at palestinepod at gmail.com and give us a follow on Instagram at the Palestine Pod. Find us also on Patreon, where you get early access to the Palestine Pod episodes and additional podcasts per week. We're also hosting our monthly Zoom happy hours with our Patreon subscribers only. So really exciting stuff. Check us out on patreon.com slash Palestine pod. Today's guest is Palestinian American Grammy award winning musical artist, DJ and music producer Farid Karam Nassad, also known as Fred Rick. Do you want me to call you Farid or Fred? What do you go by? Like whatever makes you happy. Whatever. Okay, we're going Farid. Let's go Palestinian, right? Why? Right. Why? Yeah, it's yeah, a absolutely. Palestinian show, so that's exactly. <laughs> Farid, welcome to the Palestine Pod. Thank you so much. Let's go back to the beginning. Tell us where your family is from in Palestine, and let us know. Do you get to go back? Have you been there? And and if so, when's the last time you were back? My mom is from Birzeit, and my dad is from the Ramle. Have I been? I've been to Palestine three times. All three times were. Uh, at different ages of my life and actually four times i don't count it's hard to count when you were two years old that you've been to palestine so but if you count that four times and i will say the other three times as an adult were a bit challenging the record the zionists are keeping track of that and they count it oh yeah they're keeping track was it difficult for you to get into the country the first time i went it was very difficult to get in because i i was going to my for my cousin's wedding he married a girl from the nasra and i actually went on a flight with my uncle george and his wife and my cousin saeed and my uncle george was like at that point i don't know he was some older man and they like took him aside and we basically stayed in the security zone for like eight hours going back and forth with a thousand questions of the same question over and over again going through your bags like i mean they went searched my bags like five times and when i say search them they're like come with us we're gonna search your bags like taking you in a room like going through the whole thing and like so you're sitting there watching them go through your bag and i'm like they just searched my bag four times that's okay i'm gonna search it again i'm like all right well have fun it was nothing but underwear and clothes in there and it was kind of like you can feel like they're doing it to harass you but at the same time you're not harassing me you're just wasting your time you know i'm i'm here so that first time was a, was a b to say more or less. Oh, you can swear on the podcast. Yeah. And then throughout the three weeks or so that I was there, I mean, for the first week or so, we spent our time in the Ramle. So that's not in a in a security zone. You know what I'm saying? So in the Ramle is predominantly Arab uh, Palestinian town. So we didn't venture out. But then after a week, my cousin dropped. I was like, man, I want to go to Jerusalem. I want to see the city. Like, I'm a historic buff. I want to go see all that stuff. So me and my cousin, uh, Fredo, we went out there and he was about 15 years old. So, you know, we went to the, you know, right when we got out to the to the, to the the gate of Jerusalem, my cousin had to go somewhere. And he dropped us off and he's like, just call me and I'll pick you guys back up. We just want, I just wanted to wander around, you know what I mean? Wander around and see the people and smell the smells and see the town it was like my first time like wow jerusalem this is crazy 
go to the Church of the Sepulchre. I wanted to go see the Dome of the Rock and go see El Aqsa. And I wanted just to see the whole thing. I wanted to go see the Wailing Wall, even though they wouldn't let me go see that. And just the soldiers and every five minutes, somebody stopping you, let me see your ID. At first, it was kind of mild. Like, hey, stop. So, 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 so they start talking to me. I'm like, yo, I don't I just speak in English to everybody. Like, I don't understand. What do you want? He was like, yo, let me see your ID. I show him my passport. And like, go, get out of here. Right? And they see that American passport. Maybe like, and then after we were done there, I had just seen that movie Schindler's List. And it was an amazing film. And I remember at the end of the film, it said something about Oscar Schindler that he had planted a tree in Yad Vashem and it still stands there today. I was like, damn, I want to go see that. So I asked somebody, I, you know, I was like, somebody told me like, you can take the bus there. It's not far. So I went to the bus stop. There was somebody there and I said, you know, hey, do you speak English? And they were like, yeah. I'm like, hey, how do I, how do you get to Yad Vashem? And they're like, oh, okay, just go to that bus stop and take the bus number, blah, 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 and they'll drop you off right in the front. I was like, all right, cool. So we walked to that bus stop and a soldier came up to us. He was like, what are you doing here? I'm like, I'm going to Yad Vashem. And he was like, well, that bus don't travel here. You stop lying. I'm like, well, that, that lady just told us this. She's like, no, nah, that's a bus stop over there. And let me see your ID. I showed him my ID. And he was like, okay, cool. Yeah, you got to go to that other bus. So me and my cousin is walking to the other bus stop. And the same soldier now with three other soldiers, they're walking behind us. And my cousin, he's paranoid the whole time, you know, because he's kind of young. He's like, because those, those soldiers are coming up to us behind, from behind us. I'm like, man, them soldiers is just being soldiers. They ain't messing with us. He's like, nah, cuz they 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 look kind of weird, cuz like they're coming <laughs> over to us. I was like, I'm like, man, just relax, man. We're getting on the bus. And then in front of us comes like a military vehicle. And then them soldiers get out. And then all of a sudden we got like all these soldiers on us, right? Next thing you know, they're like, they're starting to talk to us in Hebrew and all this stuff. And I'm like, yo, man, I don't understand what you're saying. What? And then and then they start roughing us up. So they so they grab my bag. I had a bag on my like a, a backpack on my on my thing. You know what I'm saying? Because I was buying souvenirs and all sorts of stuff. So they're like, they snatch the backpack off. They start going through my bag and they're like, they're telling me to get down on the lay down on the ground. And I'm like, what? I ain't laying down on the ground. And then all of a sudden, bam, he hits me with the back of his rifle from the back. One of the other soldiers, bam, knocks me down. I was like, oh. Fuck. And then all of a sudden he's going through my bag. And then and I, I reached back in my back pocket. And I'm like showing him my passport. Man, he took that American passport, he threw it on the ground. He didn't give a, a fuck about that. And then then the commandant came after they roughed us up. They had our knee, their knees on us. My cousin's crying. They're gonna kill us, cuz they're gonna kill us. I'm like, shut up, shut up. And I'm trying to talk to them in English and shit. So then the commandant came and he lifted us up and they were like, they start talking to each other, and then he was like, what are you doing over here? I'm like, man, I'm a tourist, man. This is how you treat tourists? And he was like, you're no tourist. He said, why are you going to Yad Vashem? I said, why? I'm not allowed to go to Yad Vashem? And he was like, I was like, I want to go see Schindler's Tree. And he was like, you know how to get there? I said, yeah, you take the bus and sea bus or whatever. That's what they told. That's what the soldier told us before he beat me up. He was like, all right, take the bus. Pick up your shit. Get the fuck out of here. And I picked up my bag and I got on the bus and I get on the bus and halfway there, another soldier comes up to us on the bus, uh, undercover, and he comes and puts his hand on my shoulder like this. And he, I could see the Uzi dangling from one, under his shirt or whatever. He was an undercover. And he said, and he said, uh, how we air, he said something about, let me see your ID. I said, excuse me, what'd you say? And then when he heard me speak English, he said, uh, you have an ID? I said, yeah, you want to see my ID? And I gave him my passport and he looked, opened it up and he looked. He said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Yad Vashem. Isn't this the bus to Yad Vashem? And he was like, yeah, have a nice day. Welcome to Israel. I was like, yeah, motherfucker. So that was my first experience. We can get to the other ones later, which probably weren't as that bad, but harassing wise was equally as bad. You know? Really insane. The, the lengths to which they will go to harass Palestinians in exile that are going back to Palestine as you say, as tourists, right? Because our families have been long expelled, you know, many generations ago, our grandparents' generation was expelled. We're going to discover the land. And for the ones like you and I that are coming with the American passport, for us, we're, we're literally coming on a tourist visa for a couple of weeks to try to build whatever connection we can with the land that our, our, our families were expelled from. And that's very dangerous to the Zionist agenda. They don't want us to be there coming around, you know, coming on tourist trips because God forbid we develop a connection with the land. God forbid we start to feel at home on the land and try to go back. 
that's exactly what they don't want. And and that's why I myself, when I went, the only one time I went, I was also subject to hours and hours of interrogation and questioning. And they asked me to draw a family tree of all of my extended family. And then, and I sat there with in front of a security officer at the airport where he was like, no, and keep going and keep drawing. And I was like, I don't know all these people. Like, I don't know what you want from me. He's like, no, well, keep thinking, keep thinking, keep going. I would have just drew him a big marijuana plant. <laughs> plant. <laughs> they were like, okay, well, okay, that's not working. And then they turned their computer screen towards me and started showing me pictures of random Palestinians asking me who they were to identify them. And yeah, I was like, yeah. I, don't I know. had that done. That was my last time that I went there. That was what was done to me. I don't know who these people are. And then at the very end, it was like a hundred or so pictures later. The very last photo was a photo of my grandfather, but it was like many decades earlier. And I was like, that's yeah. my grandfather. And he goes, I know. And I was like, okay, so you know it's my grandfather. I know it's my grandfather. What are we doing here? Like, why are we why are we doing this? You already know who it is. They catch you in a lie to see if, oh, you're going to lie about it. And then if you do lie about it, then it'll be the basis for which you'll be refused entry in the future. You know, it's it's all of this. It's all engineered artificially to scare you, to make you not want to go back. Yeah. There was just that video, uh, like an audio recording of a American Palestinian going to visit. And she's like, you see my American passport. Like, you should be letting me in. Like, we send you guys a lot of money, whatever. And he's like, your American passport means literally nothing here. You have to sign this thing or we're going to keep your bag, basically. And she's like, like, no. He's like, yeah, he was like, you're Palestinian. You're not American. Yeah. She's like, I'm he's literally like, American. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that that first time that I went, I, I remember on my way leaving, I had a bottle of Drakkar Noir. You know what that is? Oh, yeah. That cologne? Okay. For it's sure. Like black <laughs> rubber cologne, you know, and they took that and my laptop. Yep. I'm like, you, you're going to take my laptop. They're like, yeah, we're going to take your laptop. I'm like, you can't take my laptop. They're like, yes, we can. I'm like, fuck that. Give me my laptop. I want my laptop. They're like, that's cool. We'll give you your laptop, but you can't get on the plane. You're going to take my cologne and my laptop. They're like, yeah, we're going to, we'll send it to you later. Yep. So they took it. And then I got my laptop and the cologne sent to my house like a month later. They're like wipe the laptop and sold it. I was like, yeah. I don't know what they did to it or what they put on there. If he takes your laptop for a month, what, I'm going to take it and start using it? Are you mad? No. So, right. They put so, an early version of Pegasus on your shit. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, for real. Like the beta version. Also took my laptop when I was on my way out, and they told me that somebody would give it to me upon arrival in Washington, D.C. I was taking the Tel Aviv to D.C. flight back to the U.S., and I was like, what? They're like, yeah, yeah, you'll get it. Somebody will give it to you in the airport in DC. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, I'm just going to get off the plane and then go to baggage claim and get my bag. And between getting off of the plane and baggage claim, somebody found me. Don't know who this person was. And they gave me my laptop in a Ziploc bag. So creepy. Yeah, I got I, They sent mine in the mail. You did better so, than me, sis. Yeah, but still, I, I mean, I, I did the same like you. I got rid of it, and I didn't keep using that. I was um, going to say yours is better because you didn't actually have to interact with a Zionist. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> so I know, Fetty, that you grew up in Michigan in a very large Arab community. When were you, I'm, I'm curious to know, when were you sensitized to our story as Palestinians? Was this something that you were like acutely aware of since you were very young, or did you sort of grow into it? Was there like a defining moment where you realize, oh, there's been some injustice in, in the story of my life and my family's life. And, and, and now I got to do uh, something about probably it. Probably at a very young age, like I knew who I was and the story of my family, because my dad is the first person to come from Palestine. He has eight brothers and sisters and he got on a boat to New York City and 40 bucks in his pocket and came to America. So my dad got a job, odds and end jobs. But my dad, uh, living in the Rumley, my dad has an Israeli passport. So he had more opportunities to him than an Arab in the West Bank or wherever else. And so he got a job at a young age working in a machine shop for an old Jewish man near his town or whatever. So he learned machining. They call it a skilled tradesman. You know. So during that time, it was 1966 or something like that, he had the skill but he was like driving taxis and this and that and then somebody told him hey, a tool shop in in flint michigan that's looking to hire skilled tradesmen you know they call it a tool and die man that's what he is you know so he went there and he was like hey they're like yeah we're hiring 
you know, let me see your certificate. Let me see your thing. He's like, I don't got none of that. I'm not even a citizen. But if you let me work here for one for a few days, I'll work for free and just show you that I can work. And they did. And then they hired him. They knew he knew what he was doing. He knew how to run a lathe and all, you know, he knew how to do skilled trades and stuff. So this tool shop would do side jobs for GM. And so when the GM guy would come in and, you know, he he started to be their best, their best tool and die man there. And they were like, hey, man, we're looking for tool and die people at GM. You, you want a job? He's like, oh, I work for these guys, man. And they gave me a job and this and this and this and that. And I don't even have a citizenship. He was like, let me go talk to my boss and I'll be right back. Then the next day, the guy came. He said, we'll pay you double what this guy pays you and we'll get you a citizenship. My dad was like, peace out. So he went to GM and, and within one month, he was had a passport. Wow. Because at that time, skilled tradesmen were all being sent. People of his age were being sent to Vietnam, were being drafted. So they had a shortage of people that were working in the factories. So that's how he became a citizen. And what he would do was when an engineer would send him the blueprints of something to cut on a die machine or tool or whatever, he would find mistakes in it and go back to him like, you guys got to fix this. This measurement of diameter of this don't fit with this or whatever. And he would get little bonuses for that because if they didn't run this part that he was he just fixed, they would have had to recall it all. So... You know, this is before computers and all that. So he saved up his money and he went back to Palestine and he brought, he went and bought an apartment building in Flint and uh, and had like a lot of land in the back. And he went back to Palestine and he brought his whole family and put wow. them in this apartment building. You know, helped everybody change, get their lives together. Like So he brought my uncles, my aunties, their wives and their husbands and their kids and everybody. My, and my Cido and my Teta live there too. You know, so they all were at this place. You know, my grandfather and my uncle, all my uncles really were like, they they always, they worked in on farms and stuff in Palestine. So they they were farmers basically, you know. So they liked that there was land in the back. You know, back then you couldn't buy Lukhiya and you couldn't buy Kusa and all that stuff. So they they had a place to grow their stuff. And my, and my Cido would grow stuff and people, other Arabs that lived around, he would make money and sell them luchia and sell them, you know, whatever he would grow during that time. You know, my Cido was my Cido was in the British Army. He was a Palestinian that was uh, when he was young, was taken in by a British officer and he worked in the British Army and did whatever. He trained horses and did things with art with soldiers. And so he was in the British Army in the during the British mandate of Palestine. So. He, so when, when 1948 happened, they arrested him because he was a soldier, basically. And, they, and he disappeared for like a couple of years and nobody knew where he went until somebody from this village that was released said, hey, I seen your husband. He's in jail. You know, and then later on, he came out. They let him go. and He had a beard like this big. But yeah, my Cedo was there. And so, you know, it was like my all my uncles and my cousins and everybody was there. So every day after school. I'd come home from school, we'd do our homework, we'd eat. My dad would come home from work from the factory and we'd get in the car and we'd go to Cito and Teta's house. And, you know, my dad would go there and see his family. It, just, it was like Palestine. They, like, they brought their Palestinian house right to this little, 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 not a, like a, not a farm, but, you know, a little thing. And so all my cousins would be there and I'd play with my cousins and my grandfather and, you know, they'd make food and the aunties and, you know, the whole thing you know to make a village and one of the first things I remember my first language was Arabic I didn't even speak English when I but when I started going to kindergarten the reason why my name is Fred is because my mom was you know she's a young girl from Palestine she'd come into America my name is Farid she didn't want the kids to tease me so they gave she gave me an American name to tell the school oh his name is Fred you know because she didn't want the kids to tease me or whatever but I didn't speak English so they were teasing me anyway I'm a I'm an Arab kid going to a white school in the middle of Michigan. I remember when I started to go to school and started to learn English, I'd be at the, be at the, you know, my grandpa's house talking English, you know, playing with my cousins and playing with my, you know, brothers and stuff like that. And my Cedo would come up to us and he kind of grabbed me by the ear. Like, hey, listen, you don't speak English in my house. You only speak Arabic or I'm going to cut your hamame off. So that was it. And after that, I was like, okay, don't speak no English over here. What's a hamame for the whites? <laughs> hamame is your pee-pee. 
That's what I was thinking. Okay. It's like just... when you're a, when you're a child, a young boy child, like <laughs> the biggest threat that anybody could have above you over anything that oh God is gonna punish you. The next one slower than God punishing you is cutting your your hamam off. It's something similar in the Jewish community, but it's like we'll do it again. <laughs> I had another uh, uncle. We called him Uncle George. He wasn't my real uncle, but he was a man that was a friend of my father's that he knew. They knew families of each other from back in Palestine. But my uncle George was already established in Flint. He had some businesses. He was a little more well off. He looked out for my cousins and uncles and people that came from Palestine. He'd look out for anybody, find him a job at one of his grocery stores or he owned a movie theater and, you know, and it was the same at his house. He was a little bit more hardcore than my, even my dad and my, my Cito. And, but he was, a, he was a sweet man, my uncle George, George Farrah. And it was the same thing in his house. He'd come grab us like, Hey, don't speak English in my house. Yeah. If I hear you speaking English, I'm going to cut your mama off. Same thing. So at a young age, like, uh, I knew that I was from something different. And then, you know, like, the news would be on and my dad would be watching the news, cursing at the news about Palestine and this and that. And then, you know, we started to, he, we learned from our parents and our, and our families who we come from. And uh, sorry, I rambled on, but trying to give you the whole context. I love it. Dog, this is perfect. You're doing great. And uh, that's how I learned who I was, you know, like I ate Palestinian food or, and I would really know the difference when I go to other friends' houses that I met in, in elementary school. Like I had a good friend of mine. His name was Teddy Kim. He was a, this is like in first grade, second grade, you know, I go to his house. He was Korean and I would go to his house, his house. I would walk to his house on my way to walk home from school. And his mom would always have the garage open and him and his sister had to go right in the house, wash up and play the violin. They sit in the garage and the mom would be in there writing the notes for him and they'd be playing the violin. Hey, I got to go inside. His mom would be right at the door. Teddy, come inside now. Practice time. And then, so when I did used to go to their house and see the foods and stuff they ate, I was like, oh yeah, our food is different. We don't got this. You know what I mean? Or if I go to like one of my white friends' houses and his parents would be giving him Coke and you want some Coke? You want some sunny delight and all this stuff? I'm like, man, we ain't got this in my house. You're like, oh, really? What do you eat at your house? Oh man, we eat uh, kusa and uh, tabiyah. What, and what <laughs> I have. <laughs> What yeah, I, and tabikh, yeah. and tabikh, exactly. Tabikh is that just like it. general, like general, like hot food, right? Yeah, and even to this day, if I like, if I like, if I go home to visit and like, uh, my, I, I'm like, Dad, Mom, come on, let's go out to dinner. Let me take you guys out. We'll go get some sushi or some or some whatever. And my daddy be like, sushi, sushi, wahad bishbash and sushi. Like in 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 English, that's like you're you. You don't, you, that's, you can't eat that. That's not food. You don't get full off of that food. You know what I'm saying? And then, and then he say, nah, 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 let's stay home. Your, your mother cooks the best dinner anyway, because he, he's already trained. He's already been trained like a dog that, you know, that's it. Mom's food. Yes. Uh, it's pretty yeah. sweet, actually. It's a combination of these things of food and, uh, and uh, stuff like that. And then, and then there was one event that I remember that really made me know that I'm a, what being a Palestinian was. And I think I was in third grade or something like that. And my uncle George was a very well off man at that time. So he was into politics and he knew the mayor and he knew people like that. You know what I mean? And he was contributing money to Palestinian causes. And he was very, uh, he was a fundraiser and he was, he was very involved. And I remember one day my mom said, my mom came and got me from school they call and they say, hey, your mom's here to pick you up. Mom's here to pick me up. That's never happened before. And they picked me up. And my dad and my mom came to pick me up. And they're like, we got to go to a protest. And I was like, a protest? What's that? So we go downtown in downtown Flint. Now, my uncle owned the theater downtown, the Capitol Theater. And we used to go. That The only time I ever would go downtown is when we'd go to my uncle, see my uncle George. And my dad would go down there for, not for, for us to watch a movie, even though we'd go in there and watch a movie. He'd go down there to play backgammon with my uncle, you know, and then my uncle would go turn on the movie for us just so the kids could be watch a movie. And my dad and my uncle would be over there drinking coffee and, and we'd sit, me and my cousins would sit in the movie theater and make popcorn and watch the movie. We had a whole movie theater to ourselves. So we're going downtown this time and there's like a bunch of people standing there and they're all holding signs. And some of the people I know, some people from church, some people from here and there. 
and we did a there was a protest and i was like it was a it was for subran shatila subran shatila had happened and so we were going down there and i didn't understand it all the way and it was like my mom was trying to check, explain it to me my uncle and you know you kind of get the gist of it a little bit something happened it was a massacre and this and i remember walking into the mayor's office with my uncle and my dad and a couple other people my cousins and the, my uncle straight out screaming at the mayor like letting him have it like in a protest you know not he knew the mayor he gave him money he did business with him but he was down there to like let him have it you know and i was like damn uncle george is a g and then the next day when i went to school my friends were like hey i saw you on the news i was like what and they're like yeah and then there was in the newspaper they had a picture of the protest and you could see like little me in the thing holding my mom's hand while everybody's holding the sign. So that was like a moment for me where I was like, yo, this is like, people were driving by throwing rocks at us. And so that was like the defining moment of me knowing, okay, my people are different than everybody else. I don't think you've talked about any of this before publicly. Nah, people just want to ask about music and Snoop and Dre. Yeah, they're wrong. I mean, Snoop and Dre are cool, but like, this is amazing. But have they ever been to Palestine? <laughs> no. <laughs> Right. It's interesting because your parents brought you to the protest, right? My my parents were the type that were like, don't don't do that. Don't go to the protest. They, they wanted me to just, you know, focus on school because they didn't want me to be targeted or the, you know, the. Yeah, they're object. scared. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they're scared. They're scared. They bring that fear from over there and they bring it here. Yeah. You know? But your parents sort of encouraged that from a young age. Yeah. And, and, and also, if you knew my Uncle George, it wasn't like my Uncle George, his father, we used to, his name was Abu Basil. I don't even know what his real name was. We just call him Abu Basil. He, he was even more hardcore than my uncle. And because I was a little bit too young to remember this, but even my father would say, yeah, my Uncle Basil, every month he'd go around to all the Palestinian rich people, like the store owners and all that. And he'd be like, hey, I'm here to collect for the PLO. Kick in. And it wasn't like, it wasn't a question. You, you gave him the money and he was sending it to wherever he wanted to. So my Uncle George was kind of the same thing. Like when my Uncle George would say, I need everybody to come to the protest. You didn't really question my Uncle George. You just kind of showed up. Because if you didn't show up, he's like, where were you at? Why didn't you come? And man, my wife was pregnant. She was having a baby. Well, you know, it doesn't take two people to have a baby. You should have brought your ass down there. Like he was like that, you know. And and today you are, uh, you know, a fierce advocate for Palestinian liberation. Um, in, in the last month, I want to share some of your tweets because they're absolutely incredible. In the last uh -oh. month, you tweeted, Zionism is a racist extremist dogma and Palestine is occupied by Zionist Israeli settlers and the United States of America as an equal co-conspirator. All of the State Department words are a charade, worthless and a crime within every sentence. Yeah. Bars. Yeah, you also wrote Israel is a criminal enterprise of murderers, thuggery, and thieves. And we couldn't agree more. And I was just wondering if you ever thought about collating all of that and putting a beat on it because it's amazing. Just hearing my tweets back is like, whoa, okay. So I'll just leave them at that. But no, I haven't. I'm not trying to mix the two things together. It's not just my duty, but it's like the least I could do. And it's like a, a little bit out of maybe it's not the right word, but I want to say it's a bit of dealing with the guilt of having it so good over here while seeing what's happening over there and saying to myself, well, you got to do something. So at least you can speak up about it. That's the, oh, that's the least anybody can do. That's so obvious to, to you and to me, but not every Palestinian feels that way, right? There are yeah, some yeah. that make the choice to self-censor. And then there are others that feel this urgency, this burning urgency of, I have to do everything in my power to bring down the apartheid state in my lifetime. Do you feel like it's impacted you in any way? Have they come for you? You know, are they, you oh, know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah. All the, I mean, just if I say I'm Palestinian, they come to me. Oh, Terry, you're a Hamas supporter. Why don't you go live under Hamas? It's like, actually, I prefer the PLO. Thank you so much. <laughs> Every organization has its ups and downs. And what I've always told people is I don't give a, I don't give a fuck about any of that shit. All I care about is Anybody that stands up against the occupation and for the resistance for the Palestinian people, I support them 100%. Our people are good people. Nobody wants to walk around holding a, holding a gun. I'd rather, we're the originators of the olive branch and the gun. You know what I'm saying? Murder and destruction is not just the right of the colonial person that comes to settle you. It's also the right of the people that resist. So don't ever forget that. You can, 
terrorism is such a one-sided word like you know it's so ming mixed up in all sorts of things like it's like hard to determine who's and what's a terrorism so let's remove terrorism and whatever that is like because everybody's terrorized by somebody america's a terrorist england is one of the biggest terrorists in the world nobody wants to say that because we're the western world so everybody looks at it like well, what do you mean they're terrorists they don't strap bombs on their backs and go do this and blow things up and do that oh well no they don't do that but they just go into a whole country and massacre everybody and put a put the queen picture on the dollar and own the whole economic terrorism you know what i mean yeah what people really dislike is low-level terrorism right like yeah, if you are a mid if you're a mid to low-level terrorist you have it rough but if you are one of the executives baby boy you're about to be a king or something we should clarify though we don't view palestinian resistance as terrorism right? I, do, I don't view any ter palestinian resistance as terrorism at yeah. all yeah Palestinians have a legal right to resist occupation with force. That's according to the UN. By any so, means necessary. So yeah. let's start with that. Let's start with the rules that you made up. We didn't make these rules up. You guys made these rules up. So when you guys make these rules up and you got the United Nations and the, the Geneva and all this stuff, and you, you start being selective of how you judge the people that are following these rules and don't, then the rules are useless. Yeah, but you know what is terrorism? The pogrom that happened in Hawara. Every day is some terrorism out there. Yeah. And, you know, and then you got you got people from out here. They're like, well, that's just that those people were driven to that because of some settlers got shot. Oh, so when the tables flipped, then it's different. But what you have to remember is they say that it's settlers and all that. But the settlers are all soldiers. So I don't know what the, there's no differentiation. If you put a settlement is like just the army base. They're all armed. It's on somebody else's land. They're settling with an armed group of people. And the government is settling the people there with a purpose. Yeah, they're like putting the religious thing in front of it. Well, you know, we need our people to settle the land that God promised us. But politically, it's a different thing. They're using it for a political reason to you know, spread the borders and, and create a, a situation there where they're going to just slowly try to drive the indigenous people out. So, yeah, the only thing that they were driven by is military vehicles. Uh, what do you mean? You said they were driven by like a response to like attacks on settlers. And I was just oh. making a joke about how they just got a ride from the army. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I get it. You can't tell me all these people went in there and, and lit stuff on fire and nobody got arrested. That means they work for you. The Zionist plan is to get every Palestinian out of Palestine. Absolutely. That's the whole, that's what this is all about. So all the laws, the discrimination, the segregation, the house demolitions, the murder, the kidnappings, the night raids, the pogroms, all of it, you know, Check Gaza points. as a siege, the checkpoints, all of it is with the aim of trying to get every Palestinian out of Palestine. The, right. the project is a settler colonial project. The project right. is trying to bring all these people from all over the world, give them rights at the expense of the rights of the other people who are already there. I think that essential injustice is the one that's often missing from the context of the conversation about Palestine. So, you know, when we, when we hear about Palestine on the news, we hear about things that happen, even the reporting that took place on, on the events that took place in Nablus and in Hawara, it's without context, right? And I think what's so essential about what you do about any Palestinian who's actually trying to use their platform, whatever their platform is, is that you try to bring the context back. You try to orient people and re-educate them when they're right. faced with all of this really confusing messagery from right. the mainstream media. So I just wanted to say thank you to you for using your platform for doing that because you don't have and to. And I thank you for you guys doing taking the time out to do this. It's like the more information, even if I get one person to ask a question, yo, what is going on over there? A lot of people don't understand. You know, a lot of people aren't very political and they're not they're not even political to tell you who the president of the United States is. Yeah. I'm telling you, I got <laughs> friends that don't even give a F. So right. if I can change one person to be like, now, like if I talk to somebody about it and just give them a brief history of it's hard to give somebody a brief history, but I can do it because I know the brief history that, OK, oh, why did those people go into blah, blah, blah? Oh, well, you understand that there's an occupation and it's occupied and there's no rights and this and this and that. that that's where it starts right away. It starts from that. Why are 
why are Israeli soldiers going to, into Nablus taking Palestinian flags down? Nablus is in Palestine. Nablus is, if, you, if they keep talking about uh, the two-state solution and having peace, which is all a bunch of bullshit, if you ask me, you ain't no two-state solution. When your soldiers are going in, into that state, taking the people's flags down, that just tells you that their intention is to talk and to and to walk different. Yeah. That's not defensive. That's offensive. You know what I'm saying? They're attacking Syria every other day. Next they'll attack they don't they attack whoever the fuck they want. Did, have you ever heard of a Syrian jet flying over Tel Aviv and bombing an airport? Why is that okay? Oh, well, we're we're just defending ourselves from terrorism. But terrorism from who? Well, what about the people you killed in that airport when you bombed them? Well, those were uh, militants uh, from Iran. How do you know? Who signed off on that? So why is the, uh, it's called, you know, I call it selective moralism. That's what it is. It's like, you guys made all these rules, but you, you only get to pick who gets to follow the rules. And that shit ain't right. What's the point of international law when the four or five colonial supporting countries are just going to veto anything that goes through and nobody's held accountable because if you don't hold people accountable if if i'm paying this if i'm sending money to this guy and sending him weapons and every other week he's going into his city and murdering shooting people am i are my complicit in it too that's why i say that in that in the in my tet in my tweet when i said not only is israel occupying palestine america is occupying it too because as long as you send them weapons and they use it on the people you're a conspirator. Yeah, the U.S. funding atrocities, funding the settler colonial project to the tune of $4 billion a year, you said it, absolutely right, and shielding Israel from any accountability for any. its violations of human rights, whether that be before the U.N., through its exercise of the veto power, or just generally on the international stage, like when you see Ned Price or Secretary Blinken talking about two-state solution while Israel's eating up all the remaining Palestinian land that exists at the exact same time that they're sitting here talking about a two-state solution. When we know very well that every single year, the number of settlers continues to rise, the number of settlements continues to go up, the number of illegal outposts that then get sort of just grandfathered in as the next new settlement continue to grow, right? And all of it, like I said, goes back to the aim of kicking every last Palestinian out of Palestine and taking all the land of Palestine. The solution to solve everything is give everybody their rights, let the Palestinians go back to Palestine, abandon this obsession of creating an artificial Jewish majority state, because it is artificial, because you have to engineer it through force, decolonize through giving people rights and justice, land back, right? There's all these things that need to happen in order for justice to be achieved. But at the end of it, it's a situation where a Palestinian can live in Palestine with full rights. That sounds very beautiful, but nobody gives anything. The problem is, and the I'm a That's what it is, because those rights exist. What The fact of the matter is they're being violated. So like every day that I don't get to exercise my international right of return that is guaranteed to me under international law, every day that I don't get to go back to Palestine is a violation of that right, which already exists. Also, it's only taken by force. Anything of substance is only taken by force from Western imperial powers. They never give it up willingly. That's why we support the lion's den. That's why we support the resistance. People don't like to hear it from me, but that's my motto. I 100% agree with you. My motto is what's taken by the gun is only returned by the gun. Uh, and that, that's unfortunate. And sometimes when I say people are, oh, what are you saying? That, that gives people the right to kill Jews? Like, but also, no, that's yeah, not but what I'm saying. No, only the evangelicals get killed. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, anybody who is occupying. You couldn't have Martin Luther King without Malcolm X. There is no logical basis for the occupation of Arab Palestine, be it through religion or legality or anything. He also said by any means necessary. Right. And when I, when I, when I, when I meet what I say by that, when I say you got to have Martin Luther, you couldn't have Martin Luther King without Malcolm X. Is. Martin Luther King was the peaceful, uh, turn the other cheek and all that. And Martin and Malcolm X was like, fuck that. We're riding. A motherfucker shoots me. I'm shooting him tooth for a tooth and all that. America had to say, well, wait a minute. This is going somewhere. Either it's going his way or it's going 
Martin's way. Which one are we going to deal with? Because it's here and it's not going nowhere. So they had to deal with Martin. You know what I mean? Well, I mean, America killed both, right? So you may as well pick up a gun. What did they? What choice did they leave us? Like we've been doing BDS, we've been doing diplomacy. They dragged right. us into negotiations, negotiations what that they that? said we have to have preconditions for, right? Not even free negotiations where we can actually talk. We've tried protests, we've tried popular resistance, we've tried absolutely every method of resistance, be it nonviolent or armed resistance, everything in between using official institutions and the people all the way at the bottom, and it doesn't work. So what's gonna, what's it going to take? You, you know, it's very- I mean, uh, look, it's, at, it's, look at things that have worked. What, what made it work for uh, South Africa for them to end apartheid? Did it work for them? What, what, was the, what was the events that made it work for them? Because it, it did have a lot of nonviolent things that happened to it. That we were but, but first, Nelson Mandela was blowing up buildings before he was negotiating. Like, he didn't go into negotiation as somebody who had no leverage. He went in because they needed to negotiate. He yeah. had brought them to their knees with armed resistance. Now, but, when, but not after he was in prison for 25 years. So. Something else happened. What, yeah, I, mean, I don't know the history of it, so I'm sorry, you know, but I, had, I just know that it, I know there was an ending. What was yes. the, I know what the beginning was. <laughs> I know he was, I know he was doing that in the beginning and then he went to prison. Yeah. Stuff was going on for 25 years. He was in prison and then it ended. So what brought it to an end? So we had Nikosi Mandela on the show before, and we were talking about the different methods of resistance and what he thought was the most effective. And he said, you need absolutely everything all at once because it's a culmination of all means of resistance that will bring the occupation to its knees. Um, and that includes this shaming aspect of the world looking at it and refusing to do business with it, shaming it from, from international organizations and events. Like what we saw, for example, at the, at the African Union Summit, when the Israeli so-called diplomat was escorted out, like, you weren't even invited here. Why are you here? Get out of here. Why are they trying to get that? And that's another thing. I hate to deflect off of this, but what is the Israeli... Yeah, you want to be in the United Nations and here and there. Why do you guys want to go and infiltrate the African Union? What do they got? What has they got to legit, do with you? Because they're, they're trying to be everywhere. They're trying to be everywhere. They're they're also like, trying to be I in Europe. They're trying to normalize with the world and normalize yes. with everyone. You know. Yes, and they're also trying to join European leagues because that's you know they're they're European when it suits them. They're African when it suits them. They're everywhere. they want to compete on Eurovision and also steal Colton. We have plenty of great Palestinian hip hop artists. We had Tamar Nafar on the show. There's that young MC out of Gaza. <laughs> There's that young MC out of Gaza. MC Abdul, first lady Beautiful of hip hop. Shadia Mansour and many Shadia more. Shadia is my sister too. <laughs> and many more. What do you want people to know about Palestinian hip hop? And I don't think people ask you this question enough. I'm going to be honest. I'm not an expert with it. I'm Palestinian, but I don't really have a ties to it like that you know okay I, I, palestinian I, I, but you also are hip-hop <laughs> right tamar and nafar and suhail are, are my were my brothers and so you know I, I did some songs with them and abdul i been we're kind of sending him some music and stuff because i, I want to help him out because he's so talented and he just has a good attitude and his father is such a nice man now i've learned about some other guys like and i, I i'm gonna i'm gonna try to reach out a little bit more now my, my my cousin gazi has a record label empire and so he started a, a Middle Eastern branch from it. And I, I guess that's kind of what was making me not hesitant, but I didn't really see, I'm, I'm going to go do some songs with these Middle Eastern artists, but where am I going to put it out at? You know what I mean? Like I can't yeah. put it put it out on American record labels, but now they have a Middle Eastern uh, empire. So I'm like, oh, it'd be something cool to put out on there. So I am planning on doing a record. Uh, I'm going to go to Egypt first this year. I want to do like an EP with uh, Arab hip hop artists, not just Palestinian ones, but Egyptian or whoever I can find, you know. But I start, I always start in Egypt because I just always have a good time out there, and and it's really easy to get around there, and you know, and th there's a lot of great street musicians. Like you can go walk up to a guy that's playing. I would be like, hey man, you want to come to my little studio real quick? I got twenty bucks for you to play on something. I'll be right there. A guy shows up on his motorcycle with four other dudes sitting on a motorcycle. So it's fun. It's fun out there. But I plan on doing a, a Arabic uh, EP with some Arab, uh, Palestinian, Egyptian, whoever you know. I'm a, I want it to be a, a bunch of people. Yeah, we got some. We got some great hip hop artists. Um, and you know what? A lot of them they don't need me. They're already doing their thing, and that's yeah. the beauty about the music business now, and 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 the internet and YouTube. Man, you can do your own stuff. You don't need a 
producer like me to produce you. There's all sorts of guys that make beats now. And it, that's the thing with producers and artists. Like you, you kind you find, you can find the ones that you connect with. Even me as a producer, I was just producing, making beats in my garage until I figured that, Hey man, this is, these beats aren't doing anything in here. I got to find somebody that wants to get on them. I got to find somebody like me that needs beats. And you know, the, the, the collaboration is what makes music great. You know what I mean? And these guys, they got their own little crews and they, yeah, it's nice. To, I'll go work with one or two here, but the beauty of it is they got it on their own. They don't need, they don't need money even to do it. You know? Right, right, right. Can I ask a follow-up really quickly about that? If you don't yeah. mind, who was the first artist that sort of like put you on, you know what I mean? Like heard your beats and was like, you are a great producer. I think the first like major artist that like got my beats and like, was like, yo, I want you to produce something was Mac 10. And he would, he started his own label and, he had a, an artist named MC8, which I was always a fan of. And he was like, yo, I'm working on MC8's album and I like a beat on here. I'm going to give it to him. You want to produce it? He was like, the, I think one of the first ones that was like a major artist. I had produced other like smaller artists before that. And then that that was the first uh, artist that was like a pretty major rap artist for me, you know, from the West Coast to yeah. work with which opened the door for me to be at that record label priority records which had a bunch of artists snoop and they had a bunch of people on that label that opened the door for me to be like you know where i could walk into the building now and give my beat cds to different a and r people or i'd see an artist in the you in know the, in, the, in the lounge or whatever and and then from you getting to go to studio sessions you meet other artists that are there and other musicians and other engineers and you, you know you kind of start a networking in the music business of your reach of people you know yeah they literally got you in the door that's what's up yeah cool. and then from there you know then i like started meeting other artists and doing things like that and then i met snoop through another art another producer that gave him my cd and then i met dre from an engineer that i gave him my cd and he and the engineer gave it to dre and you know it's just kind of like that like getting your sounds out there and i just write my name and my number on my on the CD and just like hope somebody hears it, you know. Now it's a little different because now artists they just go on YouTube and they go on all these beat stars and all these different yeah. sites and they download thousands of beats. Before it wasn't like that. You had to know somebody. Hey man, you got beats. Like if you're a rapper, you wanted beats. And yeah. if you were if you were Snoop or Mac Ten or Ice Cube and all these guys, yeah, you want a Dr. Dre beat, but Dr. Dre is busy. He can't produce everybody at one time. You know what I mean? That's when I come in. That's when I started to be like, hey, I got some beats and, you know. Yeah, very cool. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. You've given us some some great stuff. Talk about how like Palestine has influenced hip hop artists from New York and the Bronx where hip hop originated. Method Man has a song with Carlton <laughs> Fisk where he says, PLO style, right? The street life is the only life I know. I live by a code style. It's mad PLO. Um, can you talk about like the? I don't, know he, I, don't like, know he just, I don't know if he said that just to make it rhyme, or if he really <laughs> said that to. Oh, like you don't think? Okay, for sure. Never mind then. I appreciate it. Yeah. PLO style. A lot of people heard. Oh, PLO style. Yeah. yeah. Same. I think like in the early '90s, like just even reference to Palestine was sort of like the representation people were looking for. Yeah, right. Good looking out. Good looking out, man. We need yeah. that. I'm sure he yeah. knows what it is now because now with the internet, oh, yeah. a lot of artists understand what it is. You know, I know all yeah. my friends always asking me. I'm like the CNN of Palestine, like calling me up, like especially right. when something's happening, they're calling me up, like, "Hey, man," blah blah blah. I'm like, so I'm trying to explain it to them, and you know, sometimes even for me, I find it hard to explain mm -hmm. all the way without having to sit there for hours and like ask, answer everybody's questions. But I appreciate them, you know, wanting to be curious about it. I'm glad that they have you to call, right? Because it really yeah. only takes one Palestinian friend for the entire friend group to be mobilized and understand what's going on. So I oh, trust yeah. I'm all the ambassador of Palestine to my hip hop community. <laughs> I I trust that they all know what's going on. All right, let me ask you some rapid fire questions. Favorite rap record of all time? I have so many, but I will say one that kind of changed my life was um, No One Can Do It Better by the DOC, which the DOC was one of them, um, was like a writer for Dre and them. And then after his record came out, he had a terrible accident and he lost his voice, so he couldn't speak after that. But he's a beautiful guy. And I just love that record because he, he was 
Um, if you haven't heard that record, go listen to it. The DOC, no one can do it better from the beginning to the end. Amazing record. I love that it was produced by Dre. Just like it was like now when you get a record, records are, you know, record labels like, oh, we need a Pharrell song. We need a Timberland song. We need this hot guy, whoever's on the radio song. We need mustard and this and that. And back in those days, it was like, nah, you didn't do that. One producer produced the record, and that's why a record had sounded like a sound, you know. So I liked it because of that, and I liked that he didn't really curse on the whole record. It was, uh, it was one vocal track, and I just, like, I just thought it was like a masterpiece, you know. I love that. So I always tell P artists like, yo, as a, if you want to be a producer or you want to be a rapper. That go back and listen to the DOC. No one can do it better. Favorite album you've produced? I haven't done it yet. <laughs> oh, I love that answer. <laughs> I watched an interview with you where you were like, I feel like I've done nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, a lot of the records I work on, I don't do the whole album. So, right. I think like you've I said, done now a it's more like, than nothing. Now it's like, okay, this <laughs> they want two songs from me here and they want two songs from me there. Yeah. Favorite Arab singer. Do you listen to Arabic music? Like, Oh, yeah. I just listen to the old stuff. The old stuff, yeah. I'm not a big fan of the new stuff too yeah. much. I like the 90s stuff, things. right? Like the 90s stuff. 90s? Nine, like what? Like what's what's the old stuff? Like like real old? Like like Um Kalthum old? Yeah, like that. Yeah. I don't look 90s. Hell no, I don't listen to that either. <laughs> and people, my friends, like, what? You don't listen to something cut on in this? I'm like, hell no. All that shit sounds the same to me. It's going to be a tie between Abdul Halim and Fadus. Yeah, Abdul Halim Hafiz, for sure. And then Kalthum and Farid al Atrash. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to go Abdul Wahab just because my dad used to bump that on his eight track and his Cadillac all the time. <laughs> and then we'll go down from there to the other classics. Of, but, but I would say Abdul Halim and, and, uh, and Fadus are like my two top number ones. I, 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 I love Um Kalthum, but it's like Abdul Halim was like, it was like a song. It was like three minutes, two minutes, three minutes, four minutes. You know, it was like a song, you know. I, I, um Kalthum is like, each song is like an hour long. And it's like, uh, you could have broke that up. You yeah. Know I, mean? I don't want to listen to the same song over and over for an hour long. Yeah, yeah. We, we're dramatic people, though, you know, so we, we have like three yeah, hour long but, songs. Yeah. I'll, I'll say Abdul Halim. And then, and okay, I'm going to give some to the newer people. Like, some of the newer guys, uh, I like... Uh, and I got the chance to work with him. Tamir uh, Husni is really good. Um, yeah, I like I like I like one uh, Ahmed Dieb record. He's got like about four songs on there that I really like. Best Palestinian dish is stop. Yeah, it's just a couple of Palestinian questions. Then I'll let you go, unless you like insist on saying. And then I'll right. just keep talking. I'm gonna tell you, you my favorite Palestinian dish, <laughs> Mensa. Yeah, it's a good one. It's an underrated one, too. People don't often say Mensef. Mensef is the one. Because you need that that brick of fermented yogurt that, that smells. Mensef is that I'm passing out after this. Yeah, yeah. My mom makes it so good. You guys are making me hungry. Are you pro or anti-Bamya? Anti. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> there's, yeah we two, could... there, there's two Arabic dishes that I don't mess with. Mm -hmm. Bamya is one. I mean, I'll eat it if it's if like, you know. <laughs> but now I have the choice. I'm older. I don't got to eat it. So, mm. And number two, actually, the number one dish of Arabic food that I can't stand it is melfouf. Mm. Yeah. I like what I do, Ali, but melfouf, I don't know what it is. I just don't like the slimy cabbage. I just don't like it. And my grandmother, rest in peace, she used to live up here in Oxnard. And every weekend I try to go see her every other weekend. And she didn't really know how to use the phone. So when my mom would call there to check on her, she'd simply be like, yeah, tell Farid to come this weekend. I'm making his favorite dish. And I don't know why she thought my favorite dish is freaking Melfouf. <laughs> and I would go in there and right when I open the door, I smell it. Because that smell hits you. It's yeah. like, and my, it's and like. My, and she, lived, she lived with my chalo. So I know he, everybody likes Melfouf. So I'd walk in there. I'm like, oh, man, I got to eat this. And you know, like. I'd have to put hella lemon on it. Yeah. Olive oil, yogurt, taste. just cover it with things. Yeah. And then, you know, before I turn around, I come back, turn around. She put more on my plate. And, you know, like, Teta, you can't be like, stop. But to this day, my food for me don't get along. We have very similar tastes because I, I started this whole, like, let's ask our guests about Bamia. And it started an all out war between me and most of the guests because a lot of them are pro Bamia. 
I'm very anti Bamia. Yeah. It's just no, not Bamia gonna work. Bamia and me for me. I'll say my number one is Mensef. Number two is Wada Doali and Kusa. I put I, I consider them the same because whenever you have Wada Doali, usually there's Kusa too. Yeah, usually. I feel most Palestinian when when I go home to see my mom and dad. Yeah, because they don't let you forget it. <laughs> nah, you know it. That's when I feel it the most. Yeah. Actually, I saw an interview, too, where you were like, my mom takes the phone and no, you're like, when I'm with Snoop, Snoop takes the phone and FaceTimes my mom. Yeah. And I'm just like, what is your mom talking to Snoop about? I'm going like to tell she's you. Gonna she... cook for him. You need, or... to tell Fred, you need to tell Fred to find a nice girl like your wife and get <laughs> married and tell him, force him, talk to him. Mom, I get, I get off the phone and, man, your mama sure wants you to get married because I'm like, oh, man. She's hitting you with that shit too. Oh man, that's so good. Oh, that's so good. Pure heart. Bless your mom. That's amazing. Shit. I love that. She's not wasting a minute. She's telling everybody who needs to know. Well, look, you know, if any eligible ladies out there <laughs> listening to this, yeah, I, she sends a she sends a kite to uh, BDZ every morning. Probably <laughs> any eligible little girls over there that you know he's in, buddy looking to get married. My, my son. Send me pictures. The original Hinge and Tinder. Yeah. Only Birzet, though. She don't want me to get nothing. No, 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 no. Girls from here, Miss Zaybenat Birzet. Oh, oh wow. Okay. So they're like oh, restricting yeah. oh, you yeah. to the village. Thank you very much, Farid. You are Thank you so much. So Yeah, we really appreciate your time. You too, Michael. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on. And so yeah. fun. And Nida was amazing for organizing this. So I'm going to send her a big thank you as well. Also, you're a legend in the hip hop game, dog. We really appreciate everything yeah, you've done you and, and how you speak, speak for Palestine. Thank you so much. And speaking of Ninda, I just want to end by saying, man, I hope everybody gets to learn the story of the Holy Land 5 and free the Holy Land 5. We will end with that. Check out our full episodes and sources, www.palestinepod.com. Follow us on Instagram at the Palestine Pod. Send us an email at palestinepod at gmail.com and find us on Patreon, www patreon.com slash palestine pod that's been another episode of the pod thank you all so much for listening have a great day 